Chapter 9 is entitled Coping with Uncertainty. And I'm going to start by making a distinction between risk and uncertainty. I think this is a useful distinction to make, even though it's not standard. It was proposed by an economist named Frank Knight, who wrote in the early part of the 20th century. And, and this distinction... Now, it was something very similar was adopted by John Maynard Keynes, the famous uh, inventor of macroeconomics, uh, who was also writing in the early part of the 20th century, before World War II. Um, since then, a minority of economists adopt this distinction, but I think it's useful. The distinction is that risk is a situation where the odds are known. The outcome isn't known, but the odds of different outcomes are known. And uncertainty is a situation where the odds are unknown. So as an example of, of risk, if you go to Las Vegas and play a game of chance at one of the casinos, you know or could look up on the internet or in a book what the odds of winning are and the odds of losing. So, and the odds of winning a, a certain amount of, of money at any given game. So this that's a situation that Frank Knight would, would say is a risky situation. You don't know what's going to happen, but the odds are sure. An uncertain situation is one where the odds are unknown. So what is the chance that the uh, Republican Party wins the presidential election of four elections from now, four elections into the future. What is the chance that in 10 years from now, the interest rate on 10-year US government bonds will be less than 1%? There's no, there are no odds for this. There's no way to, you know, if one person said, well, I think the odds are 10%, and somebody else said, I think the odds are 20%, there's no way to determine which one of those people is correct. In fact, let, let me give you a let me give you an hist a historical example to show that even after the fact, an historical example to show you that even after the fact, it's impossible to tell who was giving the correct odds. So in June of 1944. D-Day happened, the D-Day invasion of the French coast of Normandy by the army of the United States, backed by the United Kingdom and other allies. The night before the invasion, the commanding general, Dwight Eisenhower, penned a, two versions of a speech that he was going to give on the radio in 24 hours. One version... He was the speech he would deliver if the invasion was successful, and the other version if the invasion was not successful. So here you have the the Supreme Allied Commander not knowing the evening before the attack whether the attack would be successful or not. <clears throat> now we had no idea what odds he put on it. Presumably he thought it was pretty likely that the attack would be a success. And by the way, as if you know anything about the Battle of, of D-Day, it occurred in several on several different beaches. And some of those assaults were successful, but at least one was, was quite unsuccessful. So it wasn't a it wasn't a uniform success. All right, now let's ask as of now in the 21st century, looking back on history, if somebody before D-Day had said that the chance of success was 55%, were they right? We don't know. If somebody said the chance of success is 100%, that's, they're probably wrong. If somebody said the chance of, percent, chance of success was zero, they're certainly wrong. But if somebody before the battle had said that the chance of success was 55%, how would we know, even now, after it happened, whether they were right or wrong? We can't go back into a time machine and run the D-Day invasion 100 times and see how many times it, it was a success. 
So even after the fact, some probabilities remain unknowable. So Knight would say this, that's a situation of uncertainty. Mostly in this chapter, we're talking about risk because we don't really know how to deal with uncertainty. Certainly one way to deal with uncertainty is to ask people what their best guesses are. And this generates what's called the Bayesian approach to uncertainty, also to statistical estimation, which, is, uh, which emphasizes the subjective probabilities that people have opinions about because of skepticism that there, whether there actually are any objective probabilities. All right, I now want to turn to box 9.1 in your textbook. Let me, let me pull it up. I first want to talk about risk assessment. So the title here, um, Risk of Death in the United States, Selected Environmental Hazards and the Cost of Reduction, 1990. The Council of Environmental Quality is part of the US government. So risk assessment is this column deaths per million people exposed. Well, it's actually a little bit more than that. OK, so deaths per million people exposed says if somebody's exposed to trihalomethane in drinking water or radionuclides in uranium mines, then how, how, many, how many of them would die? There's another important characteristic, which is, which is number of people exposed. And the combination of how poisonous something is, which is the death per million people exposed, and the number of people exposed would be the assessment of risk. And you see some of these so some of these are not very poisonous, and others, benzene, occupational exposure, are quite poisonous, arsenic, copper exposure, and and so forth. So that's risk ass risk assessment. The other question is risk management. So what should we do about risk? And what we should do about risk, presumably, is a function not only of deaths per million people exposed, which is which is this one, and number of people exposed. But also the here, the cost to avoid one death. In fact, the cost to avoid one death may be the primary thing that you want to look at when you're thinking about, about risk management. Because this tells you that to avoid one death by alleviating the danger of wood preservatives would cost a whole lot of money. This is in millions of dollars. Whereas the cost of avoiding one death due to exposure to trihalomethane in drinking water would cost way less than a million dollars. So that's the distinction between risk assessment and risk management. OK, what I next want to do is turn to box 9.2. And the book is trying to make a point here that the public perceives risks differently from experts. So this, the first part of the table I don't find, the first part of the box I don't find particularly useful. It is unranked priorities of an EPA scientific advisory board. So these are, these are not ranked. And then public opinion in the United States and in the UK about these different uh, risks. So this in and of itself doesn't tell you that there's a conflict between the experts and the public. But the second part, issues regarded by the public as important, but not by the experts, 
does. Now, the textbook doesn't define how they decided which issues are regarded as important by the public uh, and not by experts. So, so we don't have any numbers here, but but let's let's assume that the authors knew what they were doing, and uh, I guess actually the sources is from the UK government. So, um, uh, in, in in an article in Science Magazine, which is a, a very well known uh, journal, very old uh, journal. The point that there are issues regarded by the public as important, but not by experts. And the fact that there isn't another part of this table that says issues regarded by the experts is important, but not by the public. The point is that the public is worried, the point that the textbook authors want to make is that the public is worried about things that experts aren't worried about. And the implication is that experts know what they're talking about. So the public is irrationally fearful of the risks of some things. And that might be true. However, the, the examples that they give, in hindsight, don't really seem to prove that point. Perhaps, in fact, they might prove more the opposite. Um, well, the first one here, oil spills. So 60% of the U.S. public in 1990 thought oil spills were an important problem. 53% uh, of the U.K. public, according to your textbook authors, experts didn't think that oil spills was an important problem. Well, you've probably heard of, or may have heard of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill when Barack Obama was president. This huge oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And an oil rig, an oil well, got damaged and it was spewing oil into the Gulf of Mexico, crude oil, for weeks and weeks and weeks. It, uh, it seems that actually, if the public was worried about it and experts weren't, we can, I, I think we can say now that it was the public that was right and the experts that were wrong. Although that is not, I think, what the textbook authors mean you to conclude from these numbers. Um, about nuclear accidents. So 60% of the public in the U.S. was worried about nuclear accidents. Experts weren't. The Fukushima nuclear power plant was had a core meltdown because of a tsunami a few years ago, um, which caused um, dramatic, uh, dramatic damage. The area around the plant won't be inhabitable for, I don't know, generations. Uh, so again, it seems like this was regarded as important by the public and not by experts. In this case, the public was right and the experts were wrong. So um, I don't really know how to make a general conclusion there. Yes, of, of course. Sometimes the experts will be right and the public will be wrong, but obviously sometimes the reverse is the case. So we can say that experts and the public in general have different opinions. Certainly members of the public in general have different opinions. It's not clear whether this is a situation of risk. It might be a situation of uncertainty. And so it's hard to say who's, who's more correct. All right, getting back now to to my more general notes. Next topic is disaster aversion. About 100 people every day die in automobile accidents in the US. So in a typical month, more, about as many people die in automobile accidents as died on the 9-11 attacks, the terrorist attacks in, in New York City in, in 2001. The terrorist attacks in New York City in 2001 prompted a huge a reorganization of the United States federal government, the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security. It was the, I was going to use the word pretext, well, maybe I should say use the word reason to be more neutral 
for the war in Afghanistan and was linked at least um, by the proponents of the war in Iraq with the war in Iraq. It actually didn't have anything to do with, uh, with Iraq. Um, so in other words, you had two wars and a huge amount of reorientation of the national security apparatus of the federal government caused by 3,000 people's uh, deaths. Whereas the deaths of 3,000 people a year in automobile accidents clearly don't seem to be particularly important in the sense of making the federal government do a whole lot more than what it was doing before. Um, another example, I mean, right now we're in a coronavirus pandemic, but during a regular year, tens of thousands of Americans, often more than 50,000 Americans die of the flu. But that's not seen as any kind of emergency. So the reason is that disasters like the terrorist attacks of 9-11 seem to be a lot more salient in people's minds than everyday causes of deaths, even if the everyday causes of deaths kill a lot more people. N the, the question that's raised is, should, should, should we pay attention to the perception that disasters are more important than everyday causes of death or not? In other words, what is the goal? What goal should society have? Should policymakers have? Should policymakers have a goal uh, decreased deaths, in which case you, you just look at the number of people who die in these different things and you say the flu is killing 50,000 people a year, terrorist attacks kill 3,000 people per decade, so the flu is way, way, way more important than terrorist attacks and so we're going to put a lot more effort and energy and money into the flu than we do into terrorist attacks. Or is the goal an increased feelings of security so we take into account the fact that the terrorist attacks cost a lot more people a lot of fear than the flu does. Again, I'm not talking about this COVID-19 epidemic, but before, just the kind of average everyday flu. Um, and, uh, and we say, well, since people are a lot more worried about being killed in a terrorist attack, we should think that a terrorist attack is more important to deal with than the flu. Now, there's no right or wrong answer to this question. I think most economists would probably suggest that the goal is decreased deaths, not increased feelings of security. But not all economists, and, and certainly one could, um, one can argue this and, 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 and see both sides. Okay, I think this video is long enough. We'll get to expected value in the next video.